Today on All About Canadian Books, we're going to find out how Mi'kmaq guide Sylvester Joe's identity is reclaimed almost 200 years later. But before we do, for the latest author interviews and behind the book stories, please subscribe to my channel. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. And if you're returning, welcome back. I am so excited. I have two very special guests today. I have Chief Misel Joe and Sheila O'Neill, and we'll be talking about their book, My Indian, which was published by Breakwater Books. Chief Misel Joe is an author. He has been the district traditional chief, and this is where I need your help with pronunciation, Maki Puit. Mary Bukek. Sounds much, thank you. First Nation since 1983, and he's considered the spiritual chief of the Mi'kmaq of Newfoundland and Labrador. Sheila O'Neill is also an author, a drum carrier, and member of the Hilibu, Hilibu. Hilibu. Mi'kmaq First Nation. She is a founding member and past president of Newfoundland Aboriginal Women's Network. And here is what my Indian is about. In 1822, William Pormack sought the expertise of a guide who could lead him across Newfoundland in search of the last remaining Beofit camps on the island. In his journals, Cormac refers to his guide only as my Indian. Now, almost 200 years later, Misil Joe and Sheila O'Neill reclaim the story of Sylvester Joe, the Mi'kmaq guide who was engaged by Cormac. In a remarkable feat of historical fiction, my Indian follows Sylvester Joe from his birth to his journey across the island with Cormac. But will Sylvester Joe lead Cormac to the Beothic or will he protect the Beothic and lead his colonial explorer away? You have to read the book to find out. Welcome Chief Joe and welcome Sheila to the program. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you. Now, um, Chief Joe, I understand that you are a distant relative of Sylvester Joe. Well, it's it's possible. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it as a hundred percent sure because uh, I got Joes on both sides of my families. Yeah. My my dad that was a Joe family as well, and on my mom's side, uh, her uh, her mom came from Mulligawash in Nova Scotia, and my grandfather Jador met her. Uh, uh, North Arm Newfoundland, and of course, got married. But so the Joe is on both sides of my family. It's possible, I, maybe 99% possible that I am related on one side or the other. And so, uh, Chief Joe, is this a story that you remember hearing as a young boy? Well, we heard about Sylvester Joe. Now, uh, colonials, colonialism is, is a strange, strange beast because. You know, from from the time that the Europeans arrived, they had convinced us that we were were less than human, uh, that we were uh, savages, and then we were called uh, Indians, and then we were called Micmacs. So you know, slowly we've been reclaiming reclaiming who we are, and finally, you know, we're now you know uh, Aboriginal Indigenous people, and we're Mi'kmaq. And the story about Sylvester Joe has been told and retold so many times. And no matter how often we, we claim that it's not Joe Sylvester as was put forward to us, uh, people still say it's still it's Joe Sylvester. Now, Sylvester came from Maui Pukik, without a doubt. Uh, but, uh, and we, we point out so many times that Europeans have a way of, of changing your first name and they're calling you by your last. Joe is easier to say than Sylvester. So it's easy enough to say Joe. And I still get called Joe a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my brother who lived in and worked in Labrador for 30 years, everybody knew him as Joe, not Harry. Yeah. So that's that's what we've been fighting, you know. The, and at times, I'm sure in our lifetime, we refer to him as 
as uh, Joe Sylvester herself, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, when we talk to older people, we all refer to him as, uh, no, it's uh, Sylvester Joe, and he Best came from this, this part of the world. Yeah. And Sheila, what about you? When is the first time that you heard the story? Uh, first of all, I was familiar with Cormac's uh, journal, A Journey Across the Island of Newfoundland in 1822. Uh, but the first time I heard this story was um, actually I was at a powwow in Malbecek First Nation and Chief asked me if I had time to chat with him about a project. So uh, we sat uh, at his home and he said, uh, I have this idea for a book and I wonder if you would be interested in co-authoring. So I, at, I mean, I was at powwow, I was not really prepared, but I had grabbed a, a scribbler, I guess, and I, and I found a pen and said, okay, what do you have in mind? And I started taking notes as he started telling uh, about Sylvester Joe. And 20 minutes later, we had the outline of the book. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the entire story in his head, start to finish, uh, almost chapter by chapter. Uh, so that's the first time I heard the story and I was completely enthralled. And I, I said emphatically, absolutely, yes, I would be delighted and honored to help you tell this story. Oh, that's fabulous. So you, in July of 2017 is when you two began working together on mm -hmm. this story. So as, as two authors, like I know on Instagram, I saw a picture of the two of you sitting beside each other and it looked like there were stickies all over with with your notes on it so how how did how did you work together did you do some alone or or beside each other what was your writing process for me the, the most difficult part was trying to work to uh, a computer you know online you know i'm i'm an old-fashioned i prefer to the face-to-face -face discussions yeah and uh, a lot of stuff i had written over the years had little bits and pieces and course when I uh, showed Sheila this bits and pieces that I had written it was done in sort of ad hoc way that no way can we use all of it so it almost like putting a puzzle together to start with but through her work with uh, with uh, putting an outline together she was able to piece some of this stuff together but to make it more complicated I would I would write a portion of it and give it to my wife to do appreciate it my yeah. spelling is atrocious. <laughs> my my English is atrocious. My typing is atrocious. <laughs> so she did appreciate it, uh, and then she sent it off to Sheila to finish it off. And then when I would go into town, I would get together with Sheila or do it online like this, and try and work through it that way. But that's that come it taken so long too as well. And anything that I done, I you know I didn't save it. I didn't properly date it, that it had no pages or anything. I mean, it was a bit nuts. <laughs> but I'm glad she took it uh, as a trooper, you know, and uh, we got through it. That's the best writing we did, though, was uh, sitting by the fire at your place uh, with a cup of tea. That some of the best writing was was under that, that scenario. Uh, the online stuff, yeah, that got to be kind of tedious. <laughs> Now, I mean, you, you've written about, of course, a, a, a true character. And while you were writing, um, Chief Joe and Sheila, did you feel Sylvester Joe's presence with you when you were telling a story? Well, he was with me uh, because, because we knew absolutely nothing about Sylvester Joe. We had to, we had to create a person. Mm -hmm. A lot of the story in, in the book is my own story of my own time growing up on, in the earlier years, growing up on the land. And I left there when I was 16 years old too as well and traveled to Cape Breton and did my tour around the reserves and on into other parts of Canada. So, and I've been to Miquelon many times. So it was sort of a mixture of, of uh, storytelling and using my own life journey as part of that book. So yeah, I, I definitely at, at times feel uh, really delighted and amazed and at times really angry at Cormac. <laughs> and I, maybe that comes through in the book as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I keep telling Sheila the story and then thank God to her, she was able to put it all together in a way that came out as an incredible little piece of uh, a book history that can be shared with uh, 
with the schools or whoever wanted to read it. I think it's a great little book that tells a different story than Cormac uh, was telling at the time and we have told and other people. As you know, as a reader, when I was going through the book, there was so many emotions that I felt when I was reading it. I felt incredible sadness and then also the wondrous joy of, you know, Sylvester Joe's friendship with the land. Like I thought that was it just really translated beautifully. As the writers, when you were going through writing your book, did you find that you were just on a, a roller coaster of emotions? I, I was, and you know, mm -hmm. Sheila can certainly speak to that herself. But uh, you know, every, every every page and every chapter was a part of a, a lifestyle that I grew up with, and uh, at times being extremely angry at Cormac for his for his lack of understanding of what what we had and what we walked on. And I think one time in the book, we actually talked about the Bible and yeah. talked about, uh, you know, visiting his house in St. John's mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, when he, when he walked into Wigwam, he didn't see or smell or taste the same things that an average person would see. He only saw it as some little shack out in the woods compared to his house in St. John's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think um, My Indian is a, a very important book because so much of what we've read has been from the colonial perspective. So it was wonderful to get a glimpse of, of another perspective. And I, it, uh, I can't say it enough, it's, it's, so, it's so important. What, for all of the readers, whether they be you know, young or old, what would you like them to take away from, from the story? Uh, I'll let you like go for that one. <laughs> well, when I was in grade five, I was taught in my history book that the Mi'kmaq were brought over by the French to kill off the Beatic. And, you know, within my, within my generation, unfortunately, that, that has stuck. And I think if the readers could take away anything, it would be that... Uh, just because something is written doesn't mean it's it's true that there are often uh, agendas for writing and our agenda for writing is, is to present Sylvester's side of the story. Yes, yeah. So, and also Chief Joe, you have, I mean, it, it's incredible. So, and I'll, I'll backtrack a bit. So in 1828, Cormac took the skulls of Beothix, Desmond Dewitt, and Nanazawat to Scotland. And you went to Scotland to get the remains back. You were very integral in, in this whole process. Um, you write about it in the book. Can you share with us today what it was like to go to Scotland and try and bring the remains back? Yeah, that was an incredible journey in itself. Um, you know, it was uh, because I was part of the Beatic Institute 20 years ago, just briefly. Mm -hmm. At the time, they were putting a, a, a statue together for Sean and did it to go into Boyd's Cove Park. And uh, <clears throat> one evening, I asked I asked the group if they would consider going to Scotland to talk to the museum and getting those remains back. Nobody at that stage wanted to do that. And somewhere along the way, I never forgot that. And uh, when the opportunity came up that I could actually do that, to at least go and visit and see if I could see the remains. And um, I did go. I, I didn't see the remains the first time down. Mm -hmm. But when I was leaving, I said to the people that I met, I'm, I'm coming back. And, you know, jokingly, I said, if I don't see the remains this time, I'm going to dig up Bobby Burns and take him <laughs> for study. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of gave me a hard look, and, uh, but uh, the, the following year I did go back and I did see the remains. Yes. And uh, there was four, four or five people that uh, wanted to come into a little tiny room with me, and um, I asked them if I could actually be there, be alone with the remains. They said no, somebody had to stay with you. And uh, then I asked them if I could. You know, do a small ceremony. They, they agreed to that. 
but he did agree to let everybody else go except one person had been in the room with me. And, uh, you know, it was an emotional, spiritual moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I asked him if I could touch the, touch the remains because they're all wearing white gloves and I wasn't wearing any gloves. And he said, no, you, I don't, I think that's what it is. You can't do that. You have to wear gloves. And I said, no, I just want to put gently touch the skulls. And yeah. it was like a, a flashback of a, of a movie. I think in a way that at the time of going through my mind of all the trauma that had gone through in their lives. And I actually started to cry. Yeah. And um, it, it was a, it was a, it was a fulfilling moment, but also a, an awakening uh, moment to for my own self, my own, my own spiritual beliefs. And I, at that stage, I knew I have to come back. I have to see them. I have to come get them, get back to New Plan any way I can. And thank God for uh, you know uh, the government of the day and the federal government and everybody else that got involved. Even you know uh, raising money to help me go back to Scotland again, so it was all all worthwhile. And they're not home yet; they're in their rooms, and that's no different than being in the in the museum in Scotland. So they have to go back to their final resting place mm -hmm. to to bring it all and make it all real. Yeah. So w would you? you would like them to be at like the original place from where they were taken at Red Indian Lake? Or as close to uh, that as possible. Of course, they have to be protected in a way that they can't yeah. be tampered with because that's one of the fears is that uh, you know, those skulls are so famous that uh, yeah. somebody will take them again and would they be lost forever. Mm -hmm. But uh, So that's a long discussion with government and everybody mm -hmm. else to see what the next step is going to be. But they're safe now at this stage. Yeah, they're almost in home. They're in Canada. Yeah, almost home. <laughs> almost, almost home. Almost <laughs> home. I mean, an incredible story and, and an incredible journey writing writing this book, My Indian. Um, it's just been out for a short while. How have you found it's been received? I, I From what I've gathered and, and things of, uh, what I've got back from people, uh, including today, uh, was that it was an amazing story and that brings it all home in terms of the stories that we've heard all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, one one email I got this morning, and Sheila probably got the same email. Mm -hmm. I Part of the book made her cry, part of the book made her mad, and mm -hmm. then went through different emotions going through the book. And you know what? That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Because you have to feel... You have to feel poor Sylvester uh, 200 years ago and what he was going through, yeah. what he was trying to to teach this man ways, his ways on the land, also keep him away from finding beautiful people, yeah. because he wasn't sure if that's if he would if he ever found them alive. He, he had no way of knowing what would happen. Mm -hmm. So you have to feel that in the book. I mean, you know, I know I yeah. did. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, in, intrigued by the mystery of what happened to Sylvester afterwards. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm hooked. <laughs> well, it, it's written in such a way that there is a sequel, no doubt about that. Oh, that's fantastic because when I was finished, it was it was like a big question mark that was left because you you get so invested until Sylvester and his what he's what he's done and you just want you want to know more. So I'm very excited to know that there's a sequel. This is very good news. <laughs> well, he did he did surface again after uh, 1822 when mm -hmm. Cormac wanted to go and find the remains. He, he reached out for Sylvester again, mm -hmm. and and that was in 1828. But Sylvester refused. And for good reason. Yes. And uh, so our story will, you know, Cormac and, and Sylvester left St. George's Bay in 1822, almost about the same time. And, uh, but Sylvester didn't resurface anywhere until 1828. So between that 1822, 28, six years, what did he do? So we'll have to yeah. find it out in the book what yeah. happened. <laughs> the next book. Yeah, so it is, is this what you two are working on right now? 
Um, I guess it's safe to say, Sheila, that we, we've got a chapter done already. Ah. Yes, no outline yet this time, though. <laughs> no outline yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvester's already taking you on a journey. <laughs> yes. I think this one's going to be uh, easier to do because we don't have to do any research anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it's just straight story storytelling at this stage. Oh, that'll be that'll be fun. Yeah, that'll it will be. be. So when you sorry, and I'm totally backtracking. So when you were developing the book, did you have McCormick's novel, like his journal? In every, front? every every step of the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. All yeah. geared and tape flagged. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, in the original journal, Cormac referred to Sylvester as my Indian 27 times, starting right on the very first page. 12. Oh. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> that, that's incredible. And never, ever, ever referred to him by name. No. Oh, I think just, maybe sometimes probably. you would call him Joe. Not Doc, but he would have referred to him as Joe, but when he was talking to, you know, telling the story in his own journal, it was always about my Indian. And he did yeah, read you know. Mount Sylvester after, after Sylvester Joe. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, it, leave, it leaves me speechless like it really does. It, it does. Um, I, I know you're writing the sequel now, but when you found once you finished um, the first book, My Indian, was was it was there a sense of calm with having it finished, or were you stressed with having it finished? Like how how did it feel to finish? Like you you would be so close to this man, like it would almost be hard to let go of him in some ways. I would think. Well, for me, the sequel is not letting go. I want to, yeah, wanna, yeah, yeah. But that was that was a joy for me to have it done mm -hmm. and actually get a book in your hand that I can actually read now instead of yeah. bits and pieces. But also uh, knowing that uh, we're not done yet. He's he's Sylvester's got things to do yet. Yeah, <laughs> getting some. I'm not sure what what she let out when I said <laughs> let's do the next one. <laughs> yeah. It was too soon the first time you asked. Um, no, it felt really like a big weight lifted uh, to hit submit, uh, you know, the, the, the manuscript to Breakwater. And of course, there's been some work done. Uh, it's truly been a pleasure to work with them and with the editor that worked with us. So that part was a, a different journey altogether. But it was uh, it was uh, very gratifying and very uh, um, exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, old hat for you, Chief Joe, but uh, this is my first one, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I must say, to have it all done, and I to get a message in the middle of the night sometimes that we have to speak to the editor, we have to speak to Breakwater in the morning. You've got one question, two questions, or three questions, and yeah. so it, it went on for a long time. I think if we, if we had just written the manuscript and said, here, you take it, do what you got to do with it. But we, we were, you know, personally involved in the in that part mm -hmm. of the, the book, which made it that much more important to us because, uh, you know, we met with the editor at one time, and uh, when you hear people tell you that uh, I'm reading this and I'm loving it, I want yes. I want to make sure it gets done. That's uh, that's exciting and uh, encouragement to keep moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's really, so it was really important to preserve Chief's voice in this story. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you did a beautiful job. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's, it's such an important book to have out in the world. And especially when so much of Newfoundland and so much of Canada's history has been from colonial, we need more projects like this, definitely. Yeah. So thank, I mean, thank you. Um, Sheila has agreed to give us a lovely reading from the book. Oh, good. <laughs> but today. I'm going, and, I'm going to settle back for this and get a cup of tea. And yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like watching my favorite soap opera. Yeah. <laughs> and Sheila, before, before you read, could you tell us why you've chosen this particular passage? Okay. Well, I'm going to read from uh, chapter four, Grandfather Speaks in a, in a Strange Language. 
-hmm. And there's so many reasons why I chose this, this piece. Um, it's, it's Sylvester out on the land with his grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so it's very true to the time he would have been out on the land. He would have had that relationship with his grandfather. Uh, you know, I think of my own relationship with my grandparents and then seeing, seeing them with my, with my grandchildren, my children. Um, it also kind of sets up in order for the book to be believable. We had to really hone in on why, and I guess dispel the myth uh, that the Biathic and the Mi'kmaq did actually get along and cohabitated peacefully and were not sworn mortal enemies, which is the colonial way of thinking. So in order to make it believable that Sylvester would be um, perhaps uh, protecting uh, his, uh, his brothers and sisters, the Biathic, uh, we had to give um, some background uh, so that the reader would say, yes, of course and it would all become clear. So I'm going to read chapter four, Grandfather Speaks in a Strange Language, just the first couple of pages. Something awakened Sulawe from a sound sleep. The fire in his grandfather's wigwam had burned down to a few embers. Sulawe whispered to his grandfather and asked him if he was awake, but he did not reply. It was then that Sulawe heard his grandfather talking to someone very softly. He rubbed his eyes to clear them of sleep so that he would see who had come to visit while he was sleeping. His grandfather was sitting by the fire with his back to Sulawe, and he could not see the face of his grandfather's friend. There was something strange about the conversation. The person who spoke to grandfather did so in a different language, yet grandfather seemed to understand what was being said. Sulawe wondered if he should put some more wood on the fire, but there seemed to be something stopping him from doing so. Sulawe tried to understand what was being said as he snuggled down in his bed of halibut skin. As he looked out through the smoke hole, he could see it was still dark. Who could this person be that grandfather was speaking with? He must have fallen asleep then because when he opened his eyes again, a new day had come and grandfather was moving around outside. Come and eat, grandfather said, as he moved the fire coals. You must eat fast, because today we move to the sacred mountain. Who did you speak with last night, Sulawe asked. Grandfather looked at him with surprise. Did you hear, he asked. Then he turned toward the mountain, and even though Sulawe saw his lips move, no words could be heard. Grandfather must be praying, he thought to himself. But grandfather had such a troubled look on his face that Sulawe did not think that this could be so. What is troubling you, grandfather, he asked. When the time is right, we will talk, grandfather replied. <laughs> so there is a little taste of my Indian. Thank you very much, Sheila O'Neill, for reading that. And thank you so much, Chief Joe. Thank you. I just, I enjoyed speaking with you both so much today. And for aspiring writers out there, do you two have a piece of advice that you could give them? Determination, patience, and patience, and more patience. Mm. Yeah. And for me, if you have a story that you love, tell it. Because if you love it, your readers will love it. Mm. Oh, I like that. I like both of those pieces of advice. That's wonderful. <laughs> so again, thank you to both of you. Appreciate your time and your storytelling. And for all our viewers out there, I will put links down below in the description box so you can purchase a copy of My Indian. It's a fantastic read and I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.